morning. Good morning. Christ is in our midst. He is in our show. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some years ago, about 38 or so years ago, I was, I had just graduated college and I was teaching in a high school. That's what I did as soon as I graduated. I hadn't gone to seminary yet. I was planning on going to seminary, but uh, Anna and I just got married and I was teaching math and science in high school. And my math class was geometry. And I had this geometry class and, and the kids in my class, they were all the kids that did not pass the year before. And they were in, in my class. That's my first year teaching. That's the class I got. And, um, and part of geometry, for all those who remember that, either was a joyous moment of your life or a, or a horrible thing horrible. that you try to forget. But I actually like geometry, and, and part of geometry is you have these theorems, you have these rules that you have to remember, and then you have to prove certain things. You have to, you have to prove like let's say Pythagorean's theorem. You have to prove that a squared plus b squared equals c squared by using the triangle and putting various statements and, and the reasons for the statements. Anyway, you have to like learn all this stuff. And I thought it was kind of fun, actually. It was like a puzzle. But not all my students, which you could probably figure since they all failed the year before, uh, felt that way. And so I remember giving a test one time and, and I would see the kids like leaning back a lot in their chairs while they were taking the test. And uh, the desks that they were sitting at had these openings in the front. It was like the desk. Sometimes in the old days, I don't know what it's like now, but uh, sometimes they would lift up the desk and you'd have like storage space under the desk. Well, these desks, didn't you didn't lift them up, you just kind of look back and you could put stuff in the desks. And uh, so I would see these kids leaning back and then sitting forward again, leaning back and then sitting forward. I'm like, what are they doing? And so I started kind of walking around the classroom while they're taking the test. And they all kind of like shimmy right up to their desk. You know, they get, they get really close to their, their desk and they're working on their taking the test. And I went up to one of the students and he's taking the test. He looks so diligent and all. And, and I, he had his math book, which was nearby his geometry book, and I, and I picked it up. I'm not sure really why I picked it up, but I picked up his book, and, and I just started flipping through the pages of his book. And in the book, we have all the postulates and all the theorems and all the things you have to remember. And, uh, and the whole book had like holes cut in it. They were like, like just every place there was supposed to be a theorem, it was cut out. There was, it was like the whole book was filled with these holes. And, uh, and, um, and I realized that he had laid out all the theorems in his desk. So he could look back like this, kind of like use, and then write it down as the, as the proof. I mean, not only did they cheat and have the theorems available for them to look at, but they were so lazy they wouldn't even write them down. They had to cut them out of their book. At least if they wrote them down first, maybe it would have stuck in their head. But anyway, they just cut them out. And so, and so it turned out that like, six or seven of them were all doing exactly the same thing. I forget what happened. I'm sure I failed them all on that test, but, but 
trying to work out a way for them to get through the year. So we know what that is. That is called cheating. But there's another word I'd like to use for it also, and that is manipulation. Manipulation. They were trying to manipulate the system. They were trying to manipulate their teacher, their teacher who was a very trusting person, a very uh, a loving and caring person who wants the best. They were manipulating in a way, taking advantage of my nature, someone that is concerned for them. They were taking the system and trying to rearrange it for their own benefit. Manipulation. And I bring this up because um, I want to talk about this today in terms of St. Ephraim's prayer. In particular, the phrase in St. Ephraim's prayer, lust of power. So you know the prayer. O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power, and idle talk, but give rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to your servant. Yes, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own sins and not to judge my brother or sister, for you are blessed unto the ages of ages. So the first part of the prayer says, to take certain things away from me. Oh Lord, take away from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power, and idle talk. Lust of power. This lust of power is a desire for manipulation. It's a desire to control things that maybe would not be in your control otherwise. We see it in today's scripture. James and John go up to Jesus. And it says in the scripture that they kind of go up to Jesus aside, not in front of the other apostles. James and John are brothers. And they go up to Jesus kind of quietly. And they say, hey, Jesus. Now, Jesus was just talking about his death and that his kingdom will be coming. And so James and John, I don't know if they fully understood exactly what all this meant, his kingdom, his death, his resurrection. They may not have understand all that, but what they did understand was Jesus is gonna be king, and if he's king, and we're like his best apostles, Maybe we can sit one on his left, one on his right. <laughs> so they go up to Jesus, not in front of the other apostles, because maybe the other apostles would be upset if they heard them saying to Jesus, hey Jesus, can we be one at your left, one at your right? And so they go up to Jesus and they say, hey Jesus, can we be one at your left and one at your right in your kingdom? So if Jesus is the king, the people sitting on his left and his right would be the next two most powerful people in the kingdom. Jesus says to him, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I am going to be baptized? Are you able to drink the cup that I must drink? And, and Jesus is talking about his death, his, his crucifixion. And they say, yes, we're able. Again, probably not quite understanding what everything means. And Jesus said, so, well, actually, you will drink the cup. And you will be baptized with that baptism. But it's not mine to give, but to those whom... It has been prepared, he says. So here's James and John. They're apostles. And yet they're still trying to manipulate 
the situation. I mean, these are good guys. These aren't bad guys. We're not talking Judas. We're not talking Pharisees. Uh, we're talking James and John. I mean, they're two of the heroes of the Bible. We also have another person today I'd like to highlight, and that's St. Mary of Egypt on the on this Sunday, on the uh, fifth Sunday of Lent, we remember St. Mary of Egypt. We, we read her life Wednesday night. We have her icon here. She's the middle icon of the three women, uh, circular icons on top. Her icon is also at the entrance of the church. And if you remember the story of her in the desert, and Father Zosima meets her in the desert and brings her communion. That's the icon we have there on the, uh, at the entrance. But, but Mary of Egypt, and she says this very clearly in the life that we read the other night. She was a manipulator. Before she converted and became a Christian, she gave herself over to the lusts of the flesh. She was not only a prostitute, uh, but as she says in her life, much worse than that, because it wasn't like she needed the money. She just wanted the power to control other people. And so she knew that she had a way to exert her power over other people and manipulate them and get them to do something that they may not of their own uh, I don't want to say of their own choice because everybody did choose. She didn't hold a gun to anybody, but she manipulated, persuaded them to follow a wrong path. And she's very clear about that in the life when she talks to Father Zosimus and tells him about her life before she repented. So Mary is a manipulator. When we think of those who manipulate, sometimes we want to think of other people, bad people, maybe people in the uh, political side that's different than yours. You know, they're the manipulators, or just some bad people. But very often, I see that it's us who are manipulating things. It's James and John. It's it's people that we love. It's saints in the church at some point in their life. Father Alexander Men, who was a Russian Orthodox priest and was killed in the, I think it was in the 80s, uh, probably because of the way he spoke out against injustices. And uh, if you read any of Father Alexander Men's books, they're, they're very, very good. And his sermons are very beautiful. Father Alexander Men. He said this about a lust of power in St. Ephraim's prayer. He said, this means love of authority. Everyone has it. Do not think that the cult of personality exists only in politics. It can also be present in the family or in any small community. Everyone has in himself the seeds of the aspiration to crush the will of others, to strangle and subdue it. Everybody has within them the seeds of this desire to crush the will of other people. Don't we get upset when things don't go our way? When we have a good idea and we share that good idea and other people don't think it's a very good idea? 
Doesn't that upset us? It's frustrating when people don't agree with us, when we know they should agree with us, when we know if they were intelligent people, of course they would agree with whatever this is that we're thinking. We have, if we don't go all the way through it, we still have this desire to get things our way, to manipulate the system. And I think one of the biggest ways we manipulate is an unconscious manipulation of ourselves. We don't even recognize it. We don't see ourselves as we really are. And we don't want to see ourselves as we really are. What was that movie uh, with Jack Nicholson and uh, is it Tom Cruise? There was it was a uh, uh, it was a courtroom. Very good, a few good men, and and Tom Cruise says tells Jack Nicholson who's on the stand to tell the truth. Jack Nicholson, so I'm not going to do a Jack Nicholson impersonation. <laughs> Some people can do that very well. He says, you can't handle the truth, he says. And I think that's kind of true with us. We don't really want to know the truth of ourselves. We could handle the truth if we approach it correctly. We could. But we don't want to because we don't want to approach it correctly. So what do we do? Instead of looking at ourselves and recognizing our shortcomings, our sins, because we can't really, we don't, it's painful. We don't want to look at that. You go on Facebook, people don't talk about their sins on Facebook. They talk about all these other nice things. Because we don't like to think about ourselves, our sins in that way. And so we look at other people and we notice the sins of other people. We notice the sins of other people because we don't want to look at our own sins. When we look and see the sins of other people, it distracts us. Manipulation is usually kind of an illusion. It's usually like a distracting thing of one sort or another. Like the kids, you know, looking in the desk. But this manipulation, we're distracting ourselves. We're, we're trying to fool an illusion on ourselves that this person is bad, this person has done that. It has nothing to do with whether they did it or didn't do it. But it's when we look at others, we don't see ourselves. And we are manipulating ourselves. And the church calls us not to do that anymore. Take away from me the spirit of sloth, the spirit of lust, the power and idle talk, but give rather the spirit of chastity. This is what we should have, humility. Humility to see the truth about ourselves. Patience and love. Yes, O Lord and King, Grant me to see my own sins and not to judge my neighbor. You see how they're connected. Judging my, to see my own sins and not judging other people. Because when we're judging people, we can't see our own sins. This is who the saints are. Mary of Egypt didn't always stay a manipulator. She repented. And the reason, and, and because she repented, that's the reason she's remembered on the fifth Sunday of Lent every year. It also happens that her feast day is April 1st every year. So her feast day was actually just yesterday. The more we recognize our own shortcomings, the more we'll be able to allow God in, allow His grace in to heal us. We generally don't want to do it. We try to manipulate our own minds so we don't see the truth. 
And if we don't see the truth, if we refuse to see the truth, then God's grace can't heal us and our hearts become hardened. And God may allow our hearts to be hardened. But open your hearts, ask the Lord to help you to see your own sins rather than looking and noticing the sins of others, that he might grant us healing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ is in our midst. I like the children.